Lord, our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the part that you play in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the teaching in the, that we get from the Bible, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that what we're going to study today will have a, a lasting effect on us. And we thank, that, thank you uh, that you've given us the opportunity to do this. Amen. Amen. Um, I suggest you turn the noisy one off behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Not about that early. It, it might be better if people don't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know. Um, here we go. That is... I'm sorry, what have I done? Stay in the camera. Oh, okay. Um, that is a picture of Jesus talking to his apostles on the uh, edge of the Sea of Galilee. And it is a backdrop to what I want to uh, talk about this morning. <coughs> Question, what is the purpose of your life? I've never actually asked myself that question, and perhaps I should have done, because I've, I've come up over the years with quite a number of different <coughs> directions that I think I ought to be going in, but have they always been the right direction? Have they been the final direction? And are they the best direction for me and for God? And I say that because actually it's quite important that I do things for God because he does things for me. It's only a fair exchange. So, I'm going to talk from Matthew uh, chapter 5 today, which is the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes are, if you like, a... I was going to say an idiot's guide. They're not an idiot's guide. They are the template for our lives vis-à-vis -vis our relationship with God and with each other. So, we'll look at the, the Matthew version, which is here. And could I ask somebody to start with the English, please? Yeah, go on, go on, David. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Could we go to the next one, please, and just finish off the English? Um, uh, Stephen, please. If you can carry on, please, David. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, if we can go back to the first one, and uh, Corin, would you like to do... Please. À la vue de ces foules, Jésus monta sur la montagne. Il s'assit et ses disciples s'approchèrent de lui. Puis il prit la parole pour les enseigner. Il dit Heureux ceux qui reconnaissent leur pauvreté spirituelle, car le royaume des cieux leur appartient. Heureux ceux qui pleurent, car ils seront consolés. Heureux ceux qui sont doux. Car ils hériteront la terre. Heureux ceux qui ont faim et soif de justice, car ils seront rassasiés. Heureux ceux qui font preuve de bonté, car on aura de la bonté pour eux. 
Heureux ceux qui ont le cœur pur, car ils verront Dieu. Heureux ceux qui procurent la paix, car ils seront appelés fils de Dieu. Heureux ceux qui sont persécutés par la justice, car le royaume des cieux leur appartient. Heureux serez-vous lorsque on vous insultera, on vous persécutera, on dira faussement de toutes sortes de choses de mal de vous, euh, de, à cause de moi. Réjouissez-vous et soyez dans l'allégresse, parce que votre récompense sera grande au ciel. En effet, c'est ainsi qu'on a persécuté les prophètes qui vous ont précédé. Merci Corinne. For those of you who are fairly, fairly familiar with the Bible, the words of much of the Beatitudes are something that immediately come to mind and things that you can probably relate um, without having to look them up. The Sermon on the Mount, which is, of course, was where the medium, if you like, or, or, or the opportunity for, uh, for Jesus to um, proclaim the Beatitudes, has been known as the greatest sermon ever preached. And uh, when you look at it um, and in detail, you can see why that description was being given. I'm only going to do half of it today because there's a lot to take out of it. But what Jesus proclaimed on that day was a direct challenge to the lifestyle of the people who were sitting in front of him. And that challenge is just as pertinent to us today. The sermon offered a new lifestyle, and it was a real test for those who heard it and were willing to follow its lead. All too often we are more concerned about the wrong things that make our lifestyle, lifestyle what it is. What are we going to wear? How do we keep fit and healthy? How do we perform our work, our job as parents or in other activities which seem important to us? How does our garden look? How perfect is our home? All these things are evident to others outwardly. But Jesus is more interested in what is underneath what is inside you, what makes you who you are. What we're urged to develop is a Christian lifestyle. But what is that exactly? And if it does exist, is it real? And as it, is it effective in this modern world? One way of checking this out or testing it is to examine ourselves against the standards set out in the Beatitudes. But first it's worth looking at the context, the scenario at the time. Jesus, and I'm now referring to the Luke version of the, thing, of the story, has just selected his 12 disciples, a brand new set, a brand new team if you like. And he sat them down. Now whether there was a large audience and whether Jesus intended for a large number to hear what he wanted to say is still under debate. What is certain is that there was a great crowd by the time he finished talking. The words used in the Matthew version, version suggest what Jesus said refers to people generally perhaps the assembled crowd, largely non-Christian Gentiles, whereas the Luke text points to the twelve, and that is the nearest one got to Christians at that time, or believers in, at that time, uh, as the target audience. Whichever version is intended, the message is much the same, and we should remember that the account is probably not complete, it was almost a, 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 a reduced version of what actually was said. The sermon was also stage managed in that Jesus chose the spot to, to deliver it and he made people sit down, a sure indication that he wanted their full attention. In one Bible version 
it says at verse 2, he opened his mouth, which has been interpreted as he opened his heart. Clearly, Jesus meant business. The evangelist uh, Billy Graham describes the first part of the eight as the eight beautiful attitudes. And one, one, I don't know where the word Beatitudes came from, no doubt somebody else will tell me, but within each of the um, Beatitudes, the word blessed is used. It indicates that Jesus expected Christians to be happy and blessed by God, all receiving God's favour. So here was a direct, um, uh, if you like, gift to the uh, to the apostles. So let's have a look at some of the details. We're going to follow the Matthew uh, text. And at verse 3, which I think was the first verse, not, not quite, but the first day attitude. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, now the word for poor in Greek has got two meanings. But a lot of these words do. One means without wealth which is what most of us understand it to mean. But there is another meaning, which goes a bit further. It means to be in a desperate state of abject poverty. So it is necessary to be dependent on others for support. To be poor in spirit does not imply we have no spiritual strength. It accepts that we fall short of God's standards in this respect. Even if we believe we have led or are leading a good and godly life. We must understand fully that we are deep in debt to God and need to constantly throw ourselves on his mercy. We should identify with the tax collector who declares himself a sinner in Luke's Gospel at... <laughs> Luke 18, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah, the top one. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy. And when they hear it, they have no root. Ah, loo, 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 bum, bum. I've given you the wrong reference. I've given you the wrong reference, or that is the wrong reference. <coughs> Eighteen thirteen, it should be. <laughs> right, let me find it. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Should have checked it. Never mind. This is not Matthew, the uh, tax collector, but it was uh, another tax collector. Jesus was telling the parable of the two men who prayed, and the second one was the tax collector. There was a Pharisee and a tax collector, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Clearly he had been um, taken by uh, what um, had been said. We have a desperate need to reach out to God, accepting that we are in a mess and need to listen to him properly. If we cry out like that, Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, are you a beggar seeking this heaven? I suggest you probably are. Moving on to verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. Jesus seems to be saying here the happy are the unhappy. Huh? After all, mourn is divine, defined as being sad or in grief. It's not quite, it's not wrong to think that Christians should never be happy going around heavy hearted with the world's problems on their shoulders. That said, there will be times when Christians will be sad in Ecclesiastes, it clearly says there is a time for everything. 
Did I use this one as well? <laughs> there is a time for everything. There might be a song in this. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born. A time to die. A time to plant. And a time to uproot. A time to kill. And a time to heal. A time to tear down. And a time to build. A time to weep. And a time to laugh. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. It's not wrong to be sad or to mourn. There are plenty of examples of this in the Bible. But this kind of mourning is not what Jesus was talking about here. Like so many of these things, Jesus had a totally different concept of what our, our understanding of a word was. Jesus is saying that unless we have a proper and deep relationship with God and recognize this need, we should be broken hearted and mourn the fact. Key to this is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The grief we feel when we find God for the first time is the mourning Jesus is described. And how many of you cried when you were filled with the Holy Spirit on the first occasion, when you were smitten with it? I certainly did. Um, it should have been the happiest time of my life, but actually I was pretty... <laughs> when we really mess up and offend God, letting him and ourselves down, we are in the state of mourning Jesus is referring to. You can recall that Peter wept when he realised how badly he had let Jesus down. Matthew 26, the text. Yeah. Do you remember that? Don't worry, I'm not going to let you down, Jesus. I'm not going to deny you. Rubbish. You can see why he was particularly upset. There are lots of examples of God's children crying for all sorts of reasons. They were not crying for themselves, but for the cities and the land of which they were part. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because the inhabitants could not see what was going on in their midst. The lack of spirituality is what Jesus hopes will be remedied. He says they will be comforted by the pouring out of the Spirit on all people. As Peter announced at the first Pentecost when he quoted from Joel. Acts 2.17 So I we jump about on this one a bit That's an Old Testament quotation which Peter used when he was talking to folk at the first Pentecost Often we see mourning turn into joy when the Holy Spirit intervenes which is comforting at the time but our real comfort and joy will only be complete in heaven. Okay, let's move on. Next, Jesus proclaimed the, mild, the meek would be blessed by inheriting the earth. Quite a, a wide-ranging declaration, but what does it mean? Our immediate thoughts when hearing the word meek conjures up an image of someone who is weak, spineless, feeble, and dreary. But Jesus uses the word in respect of those who are gentle, considerate, and unassuming. He likens his meek to those who are broken, in the sense that a wild horse is broken and tamed. It signifies strength and submission. Moses was described as very meek. And he was anything but weak. Now, I asked for RSV. Did you manage to get it? Numbers 12. Of course. <laughs> there we go. 13. Oh, have I got another one wrong? Numbers 12, 3. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. I okay. I must have been reading right. It might have been me, but I don't know. We won't look for it, but believe me, in Numbers, Moses is um, described as being very meek, 
very meek. Um, and so the, the interpretation of the word would, would tend to be borne out by uh, the meaning that Jesus had for that particular word. It's only, it only appears in the uh, revised, um, whatever, standard version, that's right. We are meek in this sense if we are not... NIV, sorry, NIV just says very humble man. That's right, but the word meek is used in the RSV. Yeah, which is yeah. quite correct. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, we are meek in this sense if we are not concerned with ourselves or what others think of us. Not always on the defensive or perhaps apologising. We do not protect ourselves because we have nothing worth protecting. We should not feel sorry for ourselves. Now, if we can truly say we are in the position of being meek, we shall inherit the world. We shall treat each other, we receive, uh, each thing we receive as a gift, knowing that we do not really deserve it. And when we're in that state, we shall be in a position to know how to receive what God wants to give, both in this life and in the life to come. He will give us everything we need. Moving on, hunger and thirst are not words we understand in the West today or in our own society. What is certain is that a person who is really hungry, really thirsty, is so desperate that anything else is excluded from their desires. For someone who is truly desperate, satisfying a need becomes a consuming passion, a grand desire and an overwhelming ambition. Jesus tells us we should have this attitude towards righteousness. We should be longing for a right relationship with God, to be seen as right by him and to see his righteousness in the society around us. The way the Greek text is written indicates Jesus means it to be to us to be totally righteous and not just a little bit righteous. We are not to live a Christian life just when we feel like it. A righteous life is 24-7. The price is high, but we must be prepared to pay that price if we are to please God and complete the, the relationship we want with him. Okay, so I've covered a fair bit of ground today, so far. I'm going to pause there, because too much of it in one go is, is uh, perhaps not a good idea. I've raised a number of issues that should have prompted your thoughts into overdrive. I've covered the first four steps, because that effective, is effectively is what the eight Beatitudes are. These first four steps concentrate on the need to have a personal relationship with God. The strong underlying theme is very much one of do not be as others are. Somebody said that this morning, I think. Or do not be like the crowd. You need to be different. Now the second set of steps, that's five to eight, are to do with our relationship with each other. And I shall talk about them next time if I get the opportunity. By the time I've completed the second talk, I hope that you'll be able to answer the question, what is my purpose in life? Let us pray. Oh Lord, our Father, you sent your son on his ministry here on earth with a set of writing instructions to follow. I pray we take in exactly what he's asking for us, of us and that we have the courage to answer the call you are making. Help us to develop this close relationship with you so much that, that we want to, that we desire it 
and which we should desire, uh, which you, we, you desire equally. We pray your Holy Spirit works in us to make this happen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.